Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the Rotating Machines section webinar technical talk on synchronous condensers. Before we start the webinar, there's a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their devices. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming um, on the audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the question panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SA YouTube channel and SA TV. The recording will also be made available on the SA website under the events drop down menu in this section in past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. Uh, attendance certificate will be issued a few days after this webinar. So um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Wesley Dawesme, the Vice Chairman of the Rotating Machine section. He will introduce the Chairman, Jabulani uh, Bembe, who's the Vice Chairman of the Rotating Machine section. Over to you, Wesley. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, jo uh, Joanne. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, Jabulani Bembe completed the B.Eng and M.Eng in Electrical Engineering from the University of Johannesburg. He also completed the B.Tech degree from Ball Triangle Technicon. He holds the Government Certificate of Competency in Electrical and Mechanical Engineering. He has more than 20 years experience in electrical machinery repair and the research industry. He currently works for the South African Power Utility Eskom as a researcher specializing in asset condition monitoring. He's a member of the Engineering Council of South Africa and the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and the Institute for Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Council of South Africa. Over to you, Jabu. Thanks. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you, Joanne. Welcome again to everybody. I'm now going to introduce our first speaker, which is uh, uh, Martin J. Kemper, who received his MSc Eng and PhD Eng degree from Stellenbosch University, South Africa. And that was in 1987, 1996, and in 1989. He then joined the Department of Electrical and, of Electrical and Electronic Engineering Academic Staff, Stellenbosch University, where he currently is a distinguished professor of electrical machines and drives. His research interests include computer-aided design in the control of reluctance, permanent magnet and induction electrical machine drives with electric transportation and renewable energy applications. Prof. Kemper is a South African National Research Foundation rated researcher and a registered professional engineer in South Africa. Our second speaker will be uh, Mkululi Mapula, who received his uh, uh, and PhD uh, uh, degrees in electrical engineering from the Stellenbosch University, South Africa, in 2016 and 2019. From 2020, he has been with the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Stellenbosch University, South Africa, as a postdoctorate research fellow. He's a registered member of the Engineering Council of South Africa. He's a re reviewer of for major IEEE conferences and transactions. Dr. Mabula's primary research interest is design, optimization, and control of electrical machines. His current research includes design modeling of non-classical synchronous machines as synchronous condensers. Thank you. It's over to you, uh, uh, Prof. Kemper.
Thank you very much, uh, Jubilani. Just want to make sure you you hear me. Jubilani. Yes, Prof. Yes, we Prof. are we hearing you. Yes, we can hear you, okay, Prof. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Jubilani, and also for the Rotating Machines Group for this uh, the opportunity for the presentation. We appreciate. So, um, before I start, I just want to introduce uh, some others that are all work, also working on this uh, synchronous condenser technology. It's first, uh, Dr. Uh, Akuru. Uh, he was with Stellenbosch University. is now also at he's now at the Technical University uh, of Tswane Tswane University of Technology (TUT). So he did some work for us. He's still uh, working with us on the synchronous condenser uh, project. Uh, this is myself. Then we also have <coughs> Mr. Avi Boetis, a master student now working on this project. And then Dr. Mabula, that will present the main part of the of the presentation uh, just after me. Yeah, so um, the uh, presentation is about uh, synchronous condensers, and we look at some alternative technology, which we call DC excited vernier reluctance machines, which we will introduce to you what what that is. I will first give an introduction. Um, just want to see here. I will first give an introduction uh, to the about the SCs to you. The you can see is a page number or a slide number. If you want to ask questions, you can refer to this to the slide number here. So as an introduction. Uh, I will focus a bit what is going on in industry uh, and current AC installations and introduce you to the wound field uh, ACs that we propose. And then Dr. Mabula will talk about the DCBRM technology, its principal modeling, simulation, experimental results, and conclusions. Yeah, so the questions uh, why ACs? because uh, it is an old concept uh, that, uh, in, that was used in the past. I think uh, the latest synchronous condenser South Africa was in the 1980s. Um, and they were, these were all replaced with uh, statcoms, the static bar compensators. Uh, and so the question is why why is synchronous condenser suddenly on the on the map again? Just to remind, the synchronous condenser is a synchronous machine um, that is uh, directly connected to the grid, uh, but there's no mechanical load. So the synchronous condenser is basically floating on the grid, if you can uh, say it that way. And what we what you can do then is to control the field of the synchronous condenser with that you can control reactive power flow uh, and so on so if you look at, at the advantages of ACs uh, nowadays what the industry say what, what the, the advantages are they list these you know short-term overload cap capability inertia short circuit contribution low voltage drive through voltage compensation and, and these minimum harmonic generations and so on installation possible in 16 months. This you get on the website, uh, this information of advantages. But the, the most important advantage is this short circuit contribution. It, it gives grid strength. Because the other, uh, other, uh, sorry, the other advantages you can also get from uh, statcoms from the static wire compensators you can also but the short circuit contribution and uh, giving the grid strength that is currently the issue and that is the main reason why synchronous condensers is suddenly uh, yeah installed in, in, uh, in, in connected to to the grid so um, uh, this in red is the main reason 
for for the for the AC coming back. So why are they thrown out? Uh, I guess it's capital cost. I, I'm not sure about what the cost is. Uh, maybe the static oil compensators is much less less costly. Uh, so it may, that may be a reason. The management costs, operation costs for the SCs. Uh, you know, AC run runs 24/7. And so uh, you you think about the bearings, the exciter, and the windings are issues that can fail, and and so on. So uh, that cost may be high. And then this other disadvantage is uh, long downtime. If the AC is uh, if there's a failure, uh, it's quite a bulky thing to service to get it out and rewind or checked new bearings. So the downtime is it's quite long. So we try with technology that we're using, that we're looking at to, to see if we can, uh, you know, deal a bit with these uh, disadvantages. Now, uh, <clears throat> we, we have conventional and mixed power grids. Uh, so, so in the past, before, uh, it was a so-called conventional power grid. The grid type was a conventional AC grid, and the supply to those grids is single type. That is the conventional supply synchronous machines, synchronous machines that you get from the coal power stations, nuclear power stations, the hydro. They they were all synchronous machines. So in the past, you had the conventional AC grid, and synchronous machines connected to that grid, and the whole operation protection and everything was developed around these two, the conventional AC grid with the synchronous machine that is that is powering that grid. Uh, but now uh, things have changed. It is now uh, it's now a mixed power grid. And the goal is that we want to come at the zero emission. So uh, without the coal and nuclear power stations and so on, uh, and go to a renewable energy uh, powered uh, grid. Currently, it's a mixed a grid. The grid type is still the conventional AC grid with its way of operation and with its uh, protection. Uh, that is still there. But the supply to that grid is now becoming mixed. Uh, you still have the conventional uh, synchronous machines uh, from the coal power stations that are connected. But you get more and more HVDC uh, connected to the system. So it's a mixed supply coming in and renewable energy, uh, which are mostly now becoming inverter based. So it is now a mixed power to the conventional AC grid with its operation and protection. And, and that is starting giving trouble um, because with this HVDC and inverter based you lose grid strength. And that is what you now start seeing in industry, that they start to in install synchronous condensers again. Uh, hydro pump storage seems very popular, or hybrids, you know, uh, a mix between synchronous condenser and power electronics to get back to grid strength, uh, to get the grid strength back. So here is an example in Europe of a mixed power grid. You can see there's a connection coming in from Norway, and we have a connection in to and from Holland, uh, Denmark, and then Sweden, for example. These are all connected. And you can see here the HVDC lines. There's HVDC. This is HVDC coming in. You also still have the conventional power. There's your synchronous generator, a conventional synchronous generator. And there's uh, another one. Sorry, sorry for the for the quality of the uh, circuit diagram. And yeah, so it was an issue here of synchronous condensers bringing them in to give strength to this uh, grid. And then what they did is they optimized uh, the position of the synchronous condenser. Where where do you put this at best positions? And here in red you can see where they put the synchronous condenser, uh, there's one uh, at the HVDC line. There's another one that they put here after the optimization at the HVDC line. 
And then there's another synchronous condenser that they put in also close to this uh, HVDC and the wind farms. You can see this wind farm is your renewable other um, mixed power grid that is mixed power that is coming into the grid. So this gives you an example in Europe now where to install these synchronous uh, condensers. Now, um, industry and uh, current AC installations, what we picked up, uh, my student, uh, Harvey Putters did this, uh, ABBI Tashi, Siemens Energy, General Electric, Eaton, Voith, Vec, and Andrich. They, here are industries that we saw that are busy currently or the past two years or is planning to put in uh, new synchronous uh, condensers. And countries, uh, Germany, Australia, Brazil, United Kingdom. United Kingdom is quite a large pro project at, in, in Scotland, installing a pump storage and synchronous condensers. Canada, South Korea, and China. China is known for its uh, high amount of HVDCs. So it's the same issue there. These are countries where they are, they have the past two years maybe installed synchronous condensers or are doing it or is planned to install synchronous uh, condensers. Now, uh, it is difficult to really get information from industry of, of amounts and statistics, but this is what we could pick up uh, of information. This graph, I just number the industries as number industry one, industry two, industry three, four, and five. So we look at these five industries, one, two, three, four, and five. And then we see what uh, megawatts of SC they are installing. So on this axis, you, you see the megawatts uh, reactive power, what uh, have been installed or is currently installed or is planned uh, to be in, installed. So if you look at industry one here, uh, they have installed three, one to three, uh, 50, 50 megawatt synchronous condenser recently or now or is planned and then say 190. Industry 2 is quite active. You can see they install here uh, 3 175 megawatts and 3 250 megawatts uh, of, of, of synchronous condensers. And so the same with Industry 3 and 4 and 5 is installing uh, 150 megawatts, three of them. So that gives you or what we could pick up what is going on at the moment. Classically, in the past, this was the size that they installed, uh, 250 to three, 300 megawatts. Um, but now what is very interesting, what we observed is that uh, there's a number of smaller uh, synchronous condensers that they in, in, installed, like say the sub 50 megawatts that they are installing. And this is very interesting. Why this? Because this was conventional, classically the case uh, before, uh, but now you get these installations. And what is also very interesting is that these synchronous condensers are um, placed right close to the PV and wind, the renewable energy farms. So where you have a PV farm, uh, just next to that PV farm or wind farm, they put these synchronous, these small synchronous condensers. And why? To, to get grid strength back at that point where the renewable energy. So this is very interesting what is happening. Smaller synchronous condensers at the renewable energy farms that they are installing. Very interesting uh, information that we got. So what is the technology that we propose? Now, what we propose is to take this, the wound field uh, coils of the rotor of a classical synchronous condenser, synchronous machine, and to move that wound field coils to the stator side. And if you do that, you, you left with a, a salient reluctance rotor, just iron on the rotor. So that, that is the machine that we looking at. You move the wound field coils to, coils to the stator, and what is left on the rotor is just a piece of steel uh, salient with salient poles. 
so here is a very first example of what we did uh, uh, of moving the, the wound fields to the seder. In this case, you can see here are the field coils. Dr. Akuru did the design of this machine for his PhD. Here are the field coils. It's put back in the yoke. That's on the stator side. You can also see them here. They, they are the other side of the coils. So these are now the new the DC field coils on the stator side. And then the AC coils, the normal three-phase coils, here you can see them here, phase A, B, and C, A, B, C coils. That is on the that is the alternating three-phase coils for uh, that is connecting that to, to the grid. So here you control your flux, and there is the induced voltages in the three-phase windings. And what, what is left is this salient reluctance rotor. Here you can see it. It is just a laminated uh, iron piece with these salient poles, and so very robust. So uh, the advantages now, if we do that, now we, we moved away from this because it's quite complex to do this in this way. So we moved away, but Dr. Mabura will share a bit more information. But um, in general, if you look at the advantages, uh, and just remember, the, yeah, these are still research questions to be answered. But if you just look at it, the, the advantages, there are no rotor windings anymore, there are no exciter, and, and one can then say, but it helps with cost and it's lower uh, operation and maintenance cost. These machines are characterized with very short end windings, uh, less copper, that reduces the cost. We think on site service is possible, that is to replace the bearings and windings. It's a very simple stator winding that you have to put in so that you can do this on site, which also means lower O&M. The thermal management is in a sense easier because most of all the losses are now on the stationary stator side, which you can cool down. So that, that is also an advantage. And the topologies that we're looking at, you get really huge uh, inertia per megawatt, uh, of course, of the lower uh, high pole number that we use. But there are disadvantages, still research questions that you have to look at. You have to, these double salients tend to, may have uh, mechanical vibrations, acoustic noise, you know, talk rubble. Uh, we looked at this and it looks possible to get that down. Um, and then at this stage, it, it is quite low megawatts per volume, which means higher cost. So this is a very important research question to be answered. How can we improve? on this. Okay, so the types of these machines are two that we are working on. The wound field flux switching machine is the one type, and the other one is the so-called DC excited vernier reluctance machine. So these are the two types of machines that we are considering, and uh, Dr. Mabula will take now over and start uh, discussing these two machines with you, and and complete the presentation. So, Jubilani, thanks for this. You can now unshare and then we listen to Dr. Mabula to continue. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone is seeing my presentation. Uh, so, the, the two variants which stand out is said uh, the wound feed flux switching machine and the DC excited uh, linear reluctance machine as shown in the figure. Uh, this is due to the extended operation limit uh, as well as the possibility for obtaining symmetric uh, sinusoidal flux linkage on the back EMF waveforms. Uh, the main difference in these machines is the distribution of the winding coils on the starter. Uh, the one field flux oh, switching machine oh, has a uh, Yes, we will uh, switch to the yes, uh, view. We we are seeing the, the presenter view. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? 
Yes, you can you can just change the display settings and switch it around. Yeah, you can you can try that. Yeah. Hello, is it fine now? No, still not okay. Just try your, your display settings and then uh, swap the swap the presentation. Oh, that's better. Is it fine now? Yes, that's is it fine now? It okay, fine. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, okay, so let's say continue from now. So I was in. Uh, okay, just to get one from this slide. So the the wound fit flexing machine uh, is double teeth cause uh, in both uh, phase and field windings. Uh, what is the DC VRM a single tooth cause? Uh, this gives the DC VRM an advantage of um, uh, short end windings and uh, better flux concentration. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly illustrate that on these figures. If you can see. Uh, the food flexing machine, uh, the cause uh, at a double teeth uh, distribution, while it's the DC VRM is only the single teeth uh, distribution of the windings. So to the authors, uh, a successful uh, attempt has been made, as Prof. said uh, in the past for the first time uh, on the electromagnetic design and uh, performance uh, prediction of the tubo fluid uh, flux switching ma synchronous machine as a synchronous condenser is in reference uh, uh, six uh, below. So now uh, it is left to be seen how the DC Vera M uh, with much shorter end windings would behave if designed as a synchronous condenser. Therefore, uh, in this present study, uh, the focus uh, was on on the developed design techniques uh, for analyzing and uh, predicting performance of the DC VRM as a synchronous condenser to actually uh, ensure accuracy, especially in experimental measurements. So to achieve this uh, in this study, we we built a small scale uh, prototype machine uh, where we studied theoretically and experimentally uh, for the technology demonstration so the letter is uh, presented in one of our papers, uh, as you can see, in 19 uh, below. Uh, having uh, said a lot uh, in general, of, or as Prof. is given in the introduction of the starter mounted uh, double cell and wound food machines, uh, I just want, I just tabulated on this uh, uh, a slide, some of the advantage of the DC VRM. Uh, specifically as a synchronous condenser. Uh, DC VRMs in general are novel type of machines, as said, uh, which adopt stationary field excitation. Uh, and their rotor is no permanent magnet or, or winding for excitation. And then as a result, uh, these machines uh, don't, don't need uh, like uh, brushes or slippings on the rotor side for excitation or for field excitation. Uh, the machines are also equipped with uh, non-overlapping uh, single tooth concentrated coils, which uh, result to low jaw losses, uh, higher efficiency, uh, reduce the uh, material and also uh, manufacturing cost. Also, in addition to to these uh, advantages, just to repeat, in specifically for the DCVRM, uh, the machine have only laminated rotor stake, uh, which uh, result to a robust rotor structure and the high efficiency uh, reliability. So the first figure shows the exit view of the DC VRM, uh, if I can say, uh, which, uh, and the second figure is just a side view of the DC VRM. Uh, it can be seen from the second figure uh, that uh, this type of a machine is very short end windings, uh, which is a, a huge advantage when it comes to electrical machine design. Now the topology shown is the uh, double tooth, uh, it's double top and bottom slotted structure of the of the DC VRM under study. Uh, the starter phases are labeled uh, uh, one, 
two and three, uh, which just represent the ABC phases. And also you have the field windings, which I love at the back of the F, at the back of the phase windings, which I love with uh, phase four. So this result in um, in a four core per phase and uh, twelve cores, which are both uh, connected in series uh, for this DCV item. For the manufactured uh, machine, uh, this figure is the prototype DCVRM for just for figure uh, for physical illustration. Both non-overlapping uh, one teeth concentrated cores are mounted on this data. So you have both uh, phase and field mounted on this data. Uh, and it has a slotted inner rotor, uh, which are which does not have any other PMs in or or the winding for excitation. And so, as I said earlier, the machine is cause uh, is field cause uh, face at the back, and then you have the face cause inside uh, of the stata uh, lamination. To understand the basic uh, principle operation of the DCVRM as an as an ideal uh, in an ideal situation, uh, if you consider iterated voltage, uh, single contains operate at no load uh, with the load angle delta, uh, which is the angle between the induced EMF and the voltage, approximately zero, approximately zero, and they also operate with uh, the controlled field uh, current, is illustrated in this figure. Uh, this is achieved actually by uh, reducing the electrical load on the machine, such that the the active power uh, to or from the machine is zero, and by that the power factor becomes zero, as shown in this figure. Uh, the uh, the current angle uh, between the voltage and the current becomes zero. Uh, so this is achieved. Uh, uh, so now as the field excitation increases, uh, if you look at uh, figure B, the induced EMF increases and the machine current becomes higher leading the terminal voltage as you go, uh, as, as you're increasing the field current going to my right. Since the power factor remains zero and the current angle alpha is uh, equal to 90 degrees, there's no active power uh, transferred, but a high and uh, controllable level of, of reactive power. And then in figure uh, B, the field, is, the field current leading the voltage increases above the uh, rated current. Uh, and then by that, the single condens are now uh, supplies reactive power as the machine is operating over excited. Also, the field current can be reduced below the rated field current to absorb reactive power is underexcited. In this way, uh, the machine can absorb reactive power when uh, underexcited and generate uh, uh, reactive power when overexcited at a fixed grid uh, of voltage is illustrated on a so-called uh, V-curve uh, that I'm gonna show in the next slide. So this figure shows a simplified V-curve of a synchronous condenser. Uh, at a rated uh, voltage uh, that I labeled uh, one on my right side, uh, the machine can absorb reactive power uh, below the rated field current of one. And it can also uh, generate uh, reactive power to the grid when the field is increased above the rated field of, of one. Uh, for the modeling, uh, of the DC VRM, uh, the standard three phase voltages are, are given by uh, Faraday's law and also by the uh, copper component uh, uh, loss uh, represented in a conventional three phase uh, fixed to the starter as in equation one. And at a steady state, uh, this equation one is simplified to equation two, where your K phase uh, voltage can be expressed in terms of the load angle delta and uh, and the electrical angle shift uh, given in equation three. And then in equation three, the angle theta is, is just an electrical angle defined from the pole pair in terms of the mechanical rotor position. Uh, for simplification purposes, uh, we 
we adopted the uh, the well-known pack transformation uh, with a, the direct and quadrature axis uh, rotating at an angular speed uh, fixed to the rotor. Thus, your DQ voltages in equation four uh, result uh, where the equation five is uh, the calculated line voltage. Uh, since uh, our model was in 2D uh, in this study, we uh, the effect of uh, 3D we incorporated by adding uh, an electrical calculated uh, end winding inductance uh, is in equation four, which is this LE. Also in equation four, uh, the parameters which are ID, IQ, and your flux linkages, which is lambda Q and lambda uh, Q, are the one that we, we use uh, other commercial packages to, to solve for us since we needed accuracy in this. So on this slide just show the, the calculated parameters which are which are shown in equation six and seven, which gives the soft TQ axis currents and uh, flux linkages. Uh, both the TQ uh, axis current and flux linkages are uh, calculated uh, from pack transformation and also using uh, the soft uh, phase currents and also the soft phase flux linkages. On the on the field side, uh, since the field current uh, is known and also the field resistance is known, we the field voltage was calculated just multiplying uh, both the field current and the field resistance. Uh, having demonstrated the the model of voltage, uh, current, and flux linkages parameters in a DQ exists uh, mathematical model. Uh, the top figure is just an illustration of a synchronous condenser uh, DQ axis equivalent circuit diagram uh, referred to in the study in a rotational reference frame fixed to the rotor. And the below figure uh, is a phasor diagram illustrating the relationship between the, 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 the direct and the direct and the quadrature axis, uh, are your voltage, are your current and uh, flux linkage of the DC VRM. Uh, then, for instance, uh, the, less, uh, the DQ axis voltage, uh, which is uh, the, the Q, this one, and the D, uh, can be expressed uh, in a relationship using the load angle, which is delta, with the equation illustrated below here. So now, uh, to solve the DQ axis current, uh, we we can also further express these flux linkages uh, in terms of uh, inducting in terms of reactances, so that uh, it is uh, so that the reactance can easily be calculated from the by just dividing by the currents. And then the real and uh, active uh, reactive powers are just calculated using equation uh, eleven and twelve. Uh, other performance calculation calculations include the total losses. Um, are determined from uh, the copper and rotational losses is in equation 13. So that's your copper uh, rotational losses. Uh, the copper losses are uh, some of the starter and uh, good copper losses in equation 14. And the rotational losses are uh, some of core and uh, windows and fictional losses. And now uh, it is difficult to calculate the core losses, so we used a finite method to estimate uh, this uh, parameter, and then we also use analytical uh, equation to, uh, to estimate the windage and frictional losses. Uh, on the simulation strategy of the DCV RIM, a two different element uh, uh, were used, uh, and. Uh, the first choice of, uh, of using finite element was based on the method where accurate in calculation of the parameters. So the first method uh, is a well-known uh, software package, which is ANSYS Maxo, uh, shown in the figure by a graphical user interface. The second uh, utilized finite element method is an in in-house uh, script-based uh, magnetostatic software package. Uh, called SEMFIM, also shown in the figure by the graphical user interface. Uh, it is important to state that uh, since SEMFIM is a magnetostatic uh, finite element method, uh, the 
comparison between the two packages is done at steady state. So even though Moxio uh, is a transit method, uh, for this comparison, for this study, we, we compare the two packages at steady state. Uh, it is also uh, this reason uh, why uh, the in-house package same film is ideal in applications such as uh, design optimization of electrical machines. Also, uh, since uh, same film is a script based, it allows uh, a large adaptability, and uh, this package is also an open self, uh, open source uh, package. Uh, to the top figure, uh, show two pole uh, pair uh, developed uh, models of ANSYS Mark show and uh, same film. Uh, only the half of the machine models is developed because of symmetry in order to save time in simulation. The model dimensions are and winding parameters are tabulated in the in the table below. The machine is 700 millimeter outer diameter and approximately approximately 110 millimeter stake length. Uh, and also it says uh, 12 uh, stator slots and 10 rotor slots. And the phase windings uh, on the stator are, are 69 tens. And the also the field, sorry for the rotor, it's just the field winding tens are 95. They are all in the stator side. Uh, a parameter and performance calculation strategy of performance maps uh, in reference 18 is appropriate in this study. Um, this is a methodology that we use uh, also the authors for for performance calculation of uh, synchronous machines. The figure uh, shows a flow diagram and some of the performance maps for solving currents and flux linkages for performance calculation comparison in ANSYS MAXO and SYNTHEM. Uh, this is done by uh, by varying the field current from zero and less than or equal to the maximum field current is defined in equation 15 below. An equation, uh, so that is equation 17. In equation 17, the maximum field current is equal to two times the rated field current. Uh, it's defined by where the rated current is defined is uh, the field current when your reactive power is actually zero. The first simulation shown in figure is the open circuit voltage uh, variation with the field current uh, between the two finite element methods. Uh, it can be seen that the, the figure illustrates a good agreement uh, between the two uh, uh, finite element methods. Uh, the rated operating point is then uh, chosen at 400 volts uh, line and uh, field current is chosen at nine volts, uh, which is nearly uh, just near saturation. Now uh, to demonstrate the synchronous condenser operation, the input or the grid voltage of the of the synchronous condenser chosen at 400 volts is uh, in the figure, is illustrated in the figure above and with load angle of zero for synchronous condenser operation is in the figure below. So these voltage are defined for the two packages uh, just for the illustration of the synchronous condenser in the two software packages. Uh, the result for the soft currents and flux linkages are shown in these uh, two figures, also showing a good agreement between the two packages. Uh, it's expected uh, since uh, the machine, uh, the machine uh, study of uh, for synchronous condenser operation. Uh, is not loaded. Uh, the Q axis is approximately zero, as you can see above. And the machine only have a D axis current uh, for both absorbing and uh, generating reactive power. Uh, the two figure shows the calculated reactive power uh, uh, with its variation with the field current when the machine is uh, absorbing and uh, generating reactive power from the grid. And also, as expected, since uh, there is no active power transferred to or from the machine, your, your real power uh, is actually sitting on zero but, uh, uh, when the machine is absorbing and the machine is generating uh, active power. 
So in the below figure, the effect of saturation on the ratings of the DC variant is illustrated. It is only when the machine is generating relative power, as from nine amps and above, when the field current, uh, so when the field current is above nine amps, uh, these resistance are affected uh, by saturation. Uh, this is true considering the fact that uh, the rated field current is chosen near saturation and increasing the field current above nine amps will push the machine into saturation. Uh, to validate the developed model for the performance calculation of the DC variant as a synchronous condenser, we, we conducted some uh, laboratory experiments uh, as listed by the block diagram in this figure. So a variable uh, voltage transformer is used to, to couple the, the DC uh, like it's the synchronous condenser with the grid. And then an external uh, DC supply is used to, to supply the field uh, current to the synchronous condenser. And then to synchronize the machine with the grid, we utilize a bone motor, which was uh, mechanically coupled to the synchronous condenser with the help of the of the lamps as shown in this figure. So an inverter is then used to control uh, to control the bone motor speed for synchronizing uh, the synchronous condenser with the grid. Uh, this is uh, and the bottle setup used to, for, for the experimental results. Uh, it is also important to state that the DC VRM used in this study was initially uh, designed by the authors as a generator for wind application in the reference uh, nine below. However, we are using it here as a synchronous condenser for this study. Uh, the prototype of the DC VRM was uh, designed to Operated 300 RPM uh, with the 400 volt and 50 hertz supply system. Uh, however, due to uh, some of the mechanical issues uh, in, construction, in construction, the machine was not uh, tested at these uh, ratings. The mechanical issues uh, came from using the bolts to stick the machine laminations, not using a proper frame. Uh, as seen from this figure, uh, the machine is staked on on only bolts, and then you have end, end plates at both uh, stick sides. So the structure actually did not come out symmetric. So there was an, an unbalanced magnetic pull as the field current increases, and the magnetic field put the rotor to the closest pole, causing it to lock or knock on the starter when the field current is high. Uh, for the above stated me, uh, mechanical issues, we we decided to redirect the machine. Uh, we first manually rotated the machine, uh, the machine rotor while it's taking note of the maximum current of nine amps that that can be injected into the machine before it, it locks on the rotor. Now to capture the full synchronous condenser operation uh, when absorbing and generating relative power, we we have that current so that we. Uh, as I said, like you can actually capture both uh, the V cap of the synchronous condenser. We then use the simulated open circuit voltage uh, cap uh, shown in the figure to read out the new derated voltage of 160 volts, uh, 50 hertz. Uh, however, the speed we, we didn't change the speed the speed of the machine from the rating, from the previous rating uh, where it was designed, which was uh, 300 rpm. A good uh, agreement for ex experiment validation uh, is shown in these figures of current and power for, for the measured and simulated uh, parameters of the single condenser. Uh, from the top figure, uh, it can be observed uh, that even though the, there was no, sorry, is it's it from the bottom figure, uh, which, which shows the, the power, the real power and reactive power, it can be observed that uh, even though there was no load on the synchronous condenser, uh, practical synchronous condenser draws some real power uh, from the grid for rotational losses. This means that uh, the load angle is not ideally zero, is uh, is always assumed. Uh, in conclusion, uh, accurate simulation uh, strategies of analyzing a DC variant as a synchronous condenser are proposed, uh, developed, and uh, simulated using 
accredited elements methods. Uh, with the validation of using uh, experimental results, we can say it is possible to predict uh, the practical performance of the DCVRM as a single response enzyme. Uh, this enables the proposed analysis techniques to also be used in the synthesis of not only the DCVRM, but uh, different types of machines designed for synchronous condensers. In addition uh, to the above uh, conclusion, uh, it is important to recommend that uh, proper frames that uh, are, are very essential for construction of such machines, uh, such machine structures shown below to avoid uh, mechanical issues, especially, especially when you load the machine. Now, lastly, uh, among other machine technologies, uh, the DCVRM can be utilized as a synchronous condenser to provide a stability to a stability on the South African grid network net, uh, with the growing renewable energy uh, penetration. This is because of the mechanical benefits such as the robust rotor, uh, as initially said, and also electrical benefits such as uh, a brushless DC field excitation system of the uh, machine technology that we are studying now. For further research work, we, we are currently investigating uh, how to calculate or predict the transit parameter of the DCVRM operating as a synchronous condenser under fault conditions. Uh, this also will help us to answer an answer to questions such as whether the DCVRM provides grip strength or provide grip strength under uh, this fault. Another research study may on the way is the optimization of the DCVRM on a large uh, normal frame size uh, like the D355. Uh, we are also looking forward to collaborate with the industry in terms of the manufacturing of the DCVRM in a D355 uh, normal frame size. Uh, this part the end of our presentation and we would like to thank uh, the Center for Renewable and Sustainable Energy Studies, uh, CRSES, at Stellenbosch University for the financial funding of, of, of this project. We also want to thank uh, South Africa Institute of Electrical Engineers, SAIEE, uh, Rotational Machine Group, and South Africa University of Power Engineering uh, Conference at SOPEC for the great opportunity to present our work here. Lastly, I thank you all for attention, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mabula. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Kemper. That was very, very interesting. I, I'm sure we're all anxious. We want to ask questions and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, 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 our visitors, members, you're all welcome to ask questions. You can post the questions on the side. There's a question on, on, your, on, your, on, on, on Zoom on the side there. And then we'll take the questions one by one. But in case if your questions are not, um, we've got ample time. We've spoken to the prof and, and, and Dr. Mabula that they've got ample time to ask the questions. And let's see how far you can go. Uh, Wesley, can you see? I see the first part of the question is machine in KVR and KW. Uh, yes, so we have a, a question from France asking what is the power rating of the machine uh, in kilobar and kilowatts? Uh, I can maybe answer here. Yeah. Uh, Jubilan is right. Yes, you can answer, Prof. Uh, I think the uh, Dr. Mabula can also confirm that the uh, kilobar of this machine was actually uh, small due to the trouble that we have, but I think it is rated about six kVRs, uh, six kilobars. Uh, uh, if I'm right, uh, uh, Dr. Mabula can maybe also respond yes, to that. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, that's correct, Prof. Uh, it, that is when it's operated uh, at two times the rated food current. 
for that's for when it's supplying the reactive power. Thank you, Prof. Any other question? A comment or contribution? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, Prof. I, I can while we have, uh, people are, are, are putting in their questions, I can just ask in terms of the of the power factor. Uh, 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 what is the importance of having a, a, a low power factor on on these machines? Uh, yes, the po the power factor for synchronous condenser is uh, theoretically zero. Uh, because the synchronous condenser is not about power active power uh, in any way. Mm. Uh, it, it is really truly just about VARs, you know, how much VAR it can, kilowatts or megawatts, it can supply to the grid uh, or to absorb for grid stability. So it's purely, it's basically an uh, inductor or capacitor that you have there, you know, on the grid, a huge inductor or capacitor. So it's not about power, and so yeah, the reactive power is, is not here an issue. Uh, uh, it, it is purely about reactive power supplying or uh, absorbing. Hope that answer. Yes, thank you, Tasco. Thank you very much. Okay, Wesley, can you see any, any other question? I see Mark, Mangro. Yes, um, so there's, there's a question from uh, Manuel uh, asking what is the typical inertia associated with uh, a uh, MV, MVAR uh, capability uh, or machine capability? Dr. Mabulao, I'm not sure if Dr. Akuru is, is on here, but the uh, first yeah. answer is that the inertia uh, of these machines, uh, the trouble here is that the machines that we are proposed is running at quite uh, low speeds. So uh, for megawatts, it's, it's quite a large machine. So the inertia, the uh, H factor, the H, uh, is quite uh, large compared to other uh, machines. So it's quite a large inertia. Uh, however, the volume per megawatt is a bit large. So it's, it's, it's a low. The, it is, uh, it has a, uh, the megawatt per volume is low. Yeah, that is right. So it has a, a a, a really huge inertia compared to the conventional machines. Uh, Dr. Mabula, I don't know if you want to share, and I'm not sure if Dr. Akuru is here. He can maybe also share a bit from his side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, on that issue, like uh, uh, on this machine, like we didn't uh, uh, really uh, compare uh, the, the nature of this machine with other conventional machines. But uh, on the flat switching machine, uh, especially when it goes uh, to higher hours, uh, the, the machine actually has a, a very high inertia when compared to the conventional synchronous condensers. I hope that helps to something more. Okay, there's the next one. Uh, let's, let's see about condensers. Um, yes. My, my yes, so uh, we have a question from uh, Peter um, asking, uh, well, first stating uh, uh, that, uh, that this is a good opportunity for synchronous uh, condenser technology. Uh, has uh, the South African industry considered this um, technology with, uh, with, you know, with the REIPP 
uh, and RMIPP programs on renewable and hybrid plants to locate uh, synchronous condensers on the ESCOM grid. So he's also stated that uh, they are looking at uh, battery storage but do need network strength. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> this research is at the moment uh, really just at Stellenbosch University, uh, and 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 we have no further uh, collaboration with industry or, uh, as put it on, as uh, you know, for the SD or IPP programs or, or so. So um, we the, the idea was first to, to test a bit here in principle, uh, and that looks good. We are currently busy looking at the grid strength. That looks also good, that it can really supply grid strength as conventional SEs. But yeah, now uh, we really want to open this thing to uh, become something real uh, to you know that we can that we can uh, build and test and for that we would really like to come to the south african industries if they are interested because it's a costly thing to 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 build uh, and our suggestion is that we focus first on a, on a small frame size uh, say uh, a d355 type of frame that we can design and build as a demonstration prototype. Uh, but for that, we need uh, funding. The industry is the frames, cutting the nominations, help us with the windings. And if that is, uh, if that looks good, uh, yeah, then then it is really open to put it at whatever program uh, to to consider this technology and to look further. Is this a is this, is this a real uh, possibility? As I put in my presentation, the research questions are still there, uh, and we would really like to to solve these now. Um, and so, so yeah, at the moment, uh, nothing is in on the REIPP programs or at the industry. That that is now the next step. What we would like, so it will be good if industry can contact us or. Uh, those that are on these renewable energy uh, uh, programs, uh, that we can see where where we can put this technology, see if if this is a possibility, uh, because uh, it is really a South African initiative. There's no nowhere in the world, nowhere in the world that that is doing this. We're really the first that is putting this on the table to see if this is a solution for the a cost um, aspect of of uh, synchronous condensers is this a, a viable solution so thank you for that okay i see there's another question uh, uh, wesley with regard to the design of the rotor and and, and the stator if, if if the philosophy uh, is the same but let me see it says if the signal needs to be provide frequency stability to the grid, uh, will the state and the rotor design have different proposed designs, or can the same design philosophy be used? Uh, I struggle um, to follow the question. Maybe you can just put that again, or uh, Dr. Mabula, is, can you is, can you respond? Yes, sir. Uh, for if I can understand the uh, the question the way it was put for uh, for the for the design of the machine like uh, we haven't really uh, designed in terms of the proportionality of what he is referring to uh, which is the stage that we are doing now uh, in terms of because the initial machine which we tested now was actually uh, designed for as a synchronous generator not as a synchronous condenser in, in, in that sense. So uh, the phase that we are in now is uh, specifically designed this machine as a synchronous condenser, also considering these factors. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I think there's a there's another question. Maybe I can just uh, pose this. Uh, it's from Karen okay. uh, asking: Is it possible to retrofit uh, the uh, old decommissioned gensets to these type of condensers? Uh, yes, uh, that is a very uh, valuable question. A question because we suggested this to the uh, ESCOM EPA program to look at this. And I know that there was a master study uh, doing this uh, to look at South Africa, all the uh, old power stations, maybe not in use, uh, generators still there. Uh, to what extent we can use these uh, generators as simply synchronous condenser. And that study was very positive, also in terms of uh, cost, to bring those synchronous condensers uh, to use those machines, those generators, and bring them online as synchronous uh, condensers. So the, what I have from that study is that it is a very possible uh, a method, way of doing of, of looking at old generators still there that we can use as SC. Uh, so by the way, this is also uh, used in Europe. Uh, I know in Germany, where they uh, and so on, where they use uh, old generators still uh, perfect to use, but use them as synchronous content. So this is definitely also a possibility. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Uh, any other question, Leslie? Or was there? Yeah. Uh, like um, I, I think there's a, a quick one. Uh, has this concept been patented for the design? Uh, no. Uh, this is this, it. It is not patented. The the concept of these machines. Uh, is quite well known for other applications, like for smaller drive applications or so. And uh, so the concept of the flux switching and the DCBRM is, uh, is, is known, but they're used for uh, small drive applications and so on. But what we are doing now, and, and Dr. Kulo will start using it as, uh, as maybe as a converter fit uh, type of wind generator. So, but what we are doing now is to use these as ACs, and uh, we did now a first design of a flux switching machine. Uh, but as Dr. Nabula put it, we still uh, want to do now the full design of a DCVRM, really to get an optimum design. Yeah, and so this is not done and also not patented, so it is open. Uh, there's, there's no patent or anything on this. That the structure is well known, but okay, one can look at the particular design. If that comes out, then one can maybe think of, of patent patenting the the, the design then, uh, because we are really the first to use this as, as, a, as a very large machine. So yeah, in short, uh, no, no patent at this stage. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, also. You can go ahead. Yeah, I also wanted to add what the part of said. Like, um, uh, these are more like a uh, well-known design, especially for wound application. So, uh, is as I can repeat again, like uh, the 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 new design maybe can come out uh, in our phase that we are now, whereby we are looking at uh, the optimum uh, geometric design of the machine uh, that can. For the DC VRM, for the DC VRM specifically, that can actually uh, give uh, more relative power for maybe a minimum volume of the machine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jabu, maybe I can just go to the next question. If there's another question. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Yeah, th th this is uh, linked to something also that I, I probably wanted to pose to to uh, uh, about a comparative study with you know with the traditional design. So the the question is, what is the impact of the rotor type um, 
you know, salient versus cylindrical on system inertia and, and which of these, uh, you know, would give a better response in strengthening the grid. Yeah, I, uh, the rotor type in this, uh, in a conventional synchronous condenser, you can use a conventional uh, round rotor uh, synchronous machine, uh, synchronous rotor, round rotor, uh, rotor uh, synchronous machine. But with this uh, machine, you need the saliency. So uh, it is, uh, it's not a round rotor. Uh, uh, it is a salient pole type of rotor, otherwise you lose the working of the whole machine. Uh, but to, uh, in, in comparison, uh, yeah, that is a question, you know, to see how much inertia do you lose uh, if, if you have the salient pole machines. But as I said, uh, what we found up to now with these type of machines is that uh, the inertia per megawatt is huge. It's really large. And the reason is obvious for it's, it's a much lower speed machine. So, so these are still research issues that we, that we must, uh, must look at. Uh, Dr. Mabula, I'm not sure if you want to add a bit to this thing of the inertia. Um. I would say like uh, I'd say like uh, uh, not, not, not nothing to it, Prof. I think I would say this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think um, that it's still a question, but it needs to be salient with rotor. So we cannot use round round rotor in, in our case. Uh, but looking at the inertia, uh, so far it is uh, very very. So, sorry, Prof, just in terms, just uh, help me out here to understand something. In terms of the rotor, not having windings on the rotor, now you have them on the stator. So, what role is that big chunk of steel now playing? Because you don't have a, a permanent magnet, so. Yeah, the, the rotor is a salient uh, rotor. Uh, yes. And yeah, so what it does, it's pure iron. So uh, as it rotates, uh, your reluctance that the face coils sees that varies. Uh, you have your field now generated from the state of sight, but as that thing rotates, a face coil see a flux pulsation as the rotor rotates with, with its saliency. Oh. And that, that flux pulsation induces a voltage in the AC coil. And that is the principle. So we need that salient rotor that's playing a very important role to induce to get a variable flux in the phase coils uh, and that we do with the variable reluctance uh, so that is in short i think the answer to your question oh well said thank you very much well said oh, thank you wesley anything on your side um no i i, I think that's uh, that's the questions uh, that we have for now in Stabu. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Kemba and, and Dr. Mapula. I think we have a, we had a very interesting discussion and I'm sure it won't be the last time we see you guys. I, I see there's a potential and our, our members want to know more and hopefully in the future we'll have, we'll, we'll ask you guys to come again and, and, and give us more information. I think we had a, a very Wonderful discussion. Uh, uh, what do you think, uh, Wesley? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, and and maybe just to add uh, to that uh, uh, to to the audience as well. Uh, this this uh, um, particular uh, uh, research paper was uh, uh, awarded our uh, prize for the best uh, paper in the uh, machines category for SAUPEC, and it's something that the rotating machine section uh, does uh, every year. So uh, we invite uh, the attendees and those who are working in machines research uh, to support the SAUPEC conference that runs every year. 
look out for the call and um, uh, knowing that there's a there's a, a you know a running competition an ongoing one from the rotating machine section every year thanks okay thanks Lewis. also i was just thinking you know you you would think that uh, because it's locked down and everybody's sitting at home but you can see these people that are working very hard out there so uh, once again thank you very much uh, Prof. Kempe and dr mabula yeah uh, uh, yeah. To, to, to the listeners and everybody else out there, thank you very much. As Wesley explained, you also have an opportunity if you're currently studying your master's or your PhD, uh, you're more than welcome to also take advantage of this uh, opportunity as well in the future because the SIE does uh, provide uh, uh, some kind of a reward for, for a paper like this. So thank you very much, at, at Prof. Kemp, uh, uh, Dr. Mabula, and to everybody else. Once again, if you've got Thank any questions that you probably was still want to pose, you're more than welcome, and uh, you get your answers on the on the on our website as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>